I heard a loud explosion on the left side of the plane, followed by a couple of screams and then silence. Looking back over my left shoulder, I caught a glimpse of a bright reddish-orange fireball just as it dissipated, leaving a cloud of thick black smoke trailing behind. It was about ten feet in diameter and disappeared completely within seconds. The engine sputtered a couple of times, the propeller spinning sporadically before it locked up. Quickly moving to the other side of the aisle, I squeezed into space where I could see out of a window on the left side of the cabin. I made it to the window just in time to see a smaller fireball explode from the other engine. The engines had flamed out. The propeller spun sluggishly for a few revolutions, and then it too locked into place. The propellers weren't spinning. They certainly weren't propelling, and the cabin lights were flickering on and off, creating this surrealistic B-horror movie atmosphere. We were quickly losing altitude, and then everything went into slow motion, the way it happens in the movies, when you get ten different angles of a brief moment that stretches into five minutes. As I glanced around the cabin, I captured each of those angles, and they burnt themselves into my brain, never to be forgotten. It was October, the 20th. I knew this was going to be a bear of a day as soon as my eyes popped open. There was trouble with the limo drivers the night before. Our limos, as often the case in small towns, came from a couple of local funeral homes. Needless to say, they weren't very well prepared for a bunch of dope-smoking, pill-popping drinkers literally pouring themselves into the cars after the show. Although the band had cut down their consumption substantially so far this tour, they still had the reputation, the behavior, and attitude from the past. It was in their blood. I'm not sure what we'd done to offend them any more than normal, but they didn't show up this morning for the trip to the airport. I had 26 anxious and somewhat hungover individuals milling around the hotel lobby waiting for cars, and there were no cars. Gene and I called every cab in the city, walked outside so we could watch for them, and waited impatiently. I sensed the hesitancy of everyone as we boarded the plane. After the experience on the last flight, I certainly understood why people were afraid to fly. Fine by me if they flew commercial. But from what I'd heard, Ronnie had been pretty insistent that everyone stay together on the plane. This hesitancy was the first time I realized how reluctant and scared everyone was after the backfire we had experienced. I had been assured by our last pilot that this was one of the safest planes ever made. We could easily glide to a landing without any power at all. I trusted that man, Les, and he certainly had the credentials to make the statement. He had been flying Jerry Lee Lewis around in our plane for years and had made it through hurricane-force winds and many a storm without incident. It was a bit quieter than normal when we boarded the plane. I suspect it was the passenger's trepidation. We all got seated when John, our co-pilot, opened the cabin door and confirmed everyone was strapped in. We were supposed to do the full cabin safety lecture, and used to, but after running through it a few dozen times, we got bored and dropped the ritual. Now we just piled in, claimed a seat, buckled up, and crossed our fingers. The crossing the fingers part is a very recent addition. And besides, Dean and Alan performing the steward duties caused everyone to fall out of their chairs and roll on the floor with laughter. We felt the shudder as the pilots cranked the right engine. There was a low-pitched grinding sound as the engine started turning over, coming to life a moment later with the normal outpouring of black smoke. This was somewhat alarming when it was witnessed for the first time a few months ago. Now it was routine, or at least it used to be. This afternoon, everyone was a bit wide-eyed as the engine sputtered to life. I don't know how long we fell before impact. It seems like it was an hour, but I was told later it was only 10 or 15 minutes. It was a bit foggy, and the sun was just sitting, so everything appeared to have the color sucked out of it. Only shades of gray remained. I remember the pilot's warning, first over the cabin's PA. Prepare for an emergency landing. A few moments later... The door of the flight deck flew open and the co-pilot, John, obviously panicked, wrenched his body in an impossible contortion so he could face the cabin squarely, then stuck his head through the door opening and yelled, Prepare for a crash. Shortly after the second warning, Artemis was running up and down the aisle trying to find his seat. I was mistakenly wrapped up in my own belief that we were in a plane that couldn't crash. Later, much, much later, I learned that Artemis never was secured, literally, to anything, not even a seat much less a seat belt. He just sat down on the cabin floor in the tail section of the plane across from the toilet and waited. Gene had ousted Ronnie from his nap. He'd been stretched out on the cabin floor, sound asleep. What the hell's all this ruckus about? 
That was the last thing I heard him say. Forever. The tension was building as we glided silently down. Everyone had gone comatose. There was absolutely nothing anyone could do. We were slowly and silently drifting down. I had seen an empty highway in the fading light and was convinced we were going to land on it. We were gliding smoothly. My thoughts turned to the inevitable. We were going to look pretty damn foolish trying to hitch a ride. Twenty-six people standing by an airplane in the middle of the highway. The last thing on my mind was an actual crash. The atmosphere in the plane was that of a ghost ship. Everyone and everything in it was blank. Zombies hurtling to the end. Blank faces, vacant eyes, all pale. Color had washed out of everything. I had never realized how important color is in spite of being a lighting designer for many years. It's human nature. We never appreciate what we have until it's gone. And when something is taken from us, something invaluable to our senses, it tears a hole in our very being. I'm sure everyone in the plane was experiencing the same feelings. One glance through the cabin confirmed it. Now color had vanished. All normal sounds had vanished, only to be replaced with an eerie silence accompanied by the faint rushing of air from outside. And our ability to think had vanished as well. Minds were occupied with one thing. Everyone was deep in prayer. God help us. I gazed out the window at the approaching landscape. It was dark, but I could still see an open highway with no traffic. I could still see wide open fields on both sides of the plain. But I could also see that we were heading straight for a patch of woods about three times as wide as a football field. The woods appeared to be made of tall pines. I couldn't really see well enough to discern exactly what the forest was composed of, but it really made no difference at this point. All I knew is that it was a thick forest, thick as the East Texas woods I had grown up knowing. And if I was correct, it would be comprised of large trees, perhaps a hundred feet high and the ground cover would be at least chest high and so thick you wouldn't be able to walk in it without a path or a sickle with which to create one. I realized one other thing at the moment. The forest was approaching fast, or rather, we were falling much faster than I cared to acknowledge. Darkness was closing in quickly as we silently sliced through the thick, humid air, hanging over some unknown location. I had no idea where we were, but we had to be somewhere in Louisiana. I guess the freeway below was I-10, one long piece of elevated highway that bore through some of the swampiest ground in the country, rivaling the Everglades in Florida. I was bent over in my seat, my head between my legs, in the classic crash position the cabin crew had been illustrating to me on every flight I had ever taken. My eyes kept being drawn to the ace of spades, which had curiously fallen square in the middle of my field of vision. The cabin was now completely silent. There was no sound penetrating from the outside. No engine noise, not a trace of the constant vibration we experienced during every flight. Things were quiet, deadly quiet. I straightened up for a moment and turned my head towards the front of the plane. There was no movement in the cabin at all, no talking, no screams, nothing but the faint sound of air rushing by the windows. I turned back and strained to see out the window over the frame of Mark Howard, who was maintaining his safety crouch. I could barely see anything out the window. The gray tent had overcome everything, both inside and out. It felt like a thick blanket had been thrown over the plane, encompassing us in a death hold. The words of our former pilot, Les, came to my head. The plane can make it down anywhere. It's one of the safest ever made, unless you're faced with a mountain or maybe a forest. I kept hearing his words over and over as I gazed out the window at the rapidly approaching trees. There was a shudder in the plane. It quickly became repetitive, a horrendous vibration that shook every inch of the vessel. It was followed by a series of impacts, loud explosions that sounded like gunshots, machine gunshots, and they were rapidly increasing in both speed and force. It had grown quite dark in the last few minutes, but I could make out shadows in the windows. Strobe-like ribbons of darkness were crossing the windows at a rapidly increasing rate. They were trees. I suddenly realized, as most of us surely did, we were clipping the tops of trees. And just as suddenly, I realized we were crashing in a forest. It was our worst nightmare. The plane that couldn't crash, unless we were in a forest or mountains, was crashing. I glanced out the window once again, then turned in my seat towards the front of the cabin, Everyone was bouncing up and down, shifting in their seats with the movement of the plane. There was no control, 
and the feeling I had was beyond helpless, way beyond. No, it wasn't helplessness I was feeling at all. It had turned into hopelessness, and it was the first time I had ever experienced it. Hopelessness. A gut emotion that can rip your soul apart. If you've never felt it, it's difficult to explain. It's a primordial feeling, an instinct, and it pervades your being far past the fight-or-flight syndrome that's so well taught in Psych 101. It's past panic, past any emotion I've ever felt. It's a feeling that can't, or shouldn't, be thought about. It will grab your mind and twist it until you're incapable of reasoning or thought. We felt a huge impact while I watched the cabin twist apart in the middle. Light blue sky was streaking in. Then the gap widened as the plane separated further. It was like it was being unscrewed by giant hands. It all came apart so easily. All of a sudden it wasn't dark anymore. It was, in fact, quite light, as the early evening twilight streaked in. It was the most beautiful color of blue, with splashes of rose and magenta, mimicking a sunset. I awoke in total darkness. I don't know where I was or how long I'd been there. I felt a warm, thick liquid dripping down my face, and when I tried to lick my lips, I got a salty, metallic taste. I tried to move, but couldn't. Nothing responded. As much as I wanted to move my limbs, it was out of the question. They had ceased functioning. There was some sound. It sounded like rustling grass, and there were footsteps and voices, but I couldn't make anything out. It was all muffled. I couldn't feel anything, and I knew I had little time left before the darkness would envelop me again. So I tried to call out. I couldn't hear my voice. I don't know if I was successful. And then a wave of darkness washed back over me, and I returned to a wonderfully deep sleep. My eyes opened for a moment, and I realized I was being helped along by a couple of men. Their shoulders under my arms, my feet dragging along in the mud. My face and clothing, my whole body, was dripping with a thick, dark fluid. It felt like molasses. I saw Dean lying on the ground, just visible in the darkness. Although there were sporadic beams of light flickering around and some spotlights were illuminating the scene from above, the sun gone crazy. The lights were creating weird shadows that moved about in slow sweeps, and then they jump erratically to another spot and start sweeping again. I was furious at Dean. Here we are in trouble, in some kind of twilight zone, and Dean sleeping, I thought. Then things went gray and proceeded to black. Spokesman said this was one of the top five rock groups in the country. Leonard Skinner. Can you see the smile? Its latest album, Street Survivors, had already gone gold after its release this week. The group took its name from a teacher who expelled three of the musicians from a Florida high school ten years ago for wearing long hair. Three members of the group, including its leader, Ronnie Van Zandt, were among the six people killed in this crash. Some of the 20 survivors said several members of the group had argued against taking the plane. They were going to vote on whether to continue flying in it after a concert tonight. Investigators said the plane ran out of gas and crashed 200 yards short of where the pilot had hoped to set it down. Although several members of the group survived, a spokesman said the band will never play again under its old name. Bob Brown, ABC News. I awoke at some point. It was like coming up for air. And when I opened my eyes, I saw Linda. There was nothing else there. Everything was gray around her. But she was there, and she was holding something large and white in her hand on the bed. I didn't know where I was, but I knew something bad had happened. I looked at Linda, trying to focus, and asked, Ronnie? She cheered up, and with a brave smile told me he was gone. I slipped back into my comfortable world of nothing. My eyes opened again at some point. It could have been hours, or days, or weeks. Linda was there, and I saw my father behind her, and there were flowers all around the room. I felt myself slipping and quickly asked, Cassie? Linda was shaking her head back and forth as I slipped back into my cocoon. Some time later, I woke yet again, and again there was no sense of time, but my brother Rodney was with Linda and my father. I had nothing to say, but heard my lips utter a name. Steve? I woke from my coma one last time and managed to whisper, Dean? 
before I collapsed into my world of comfort, of blackness. We boarded the plane the morning of October 20th, 1977, on our way to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and crashed at about 6.45. One engine had a faulty magneto and had to be run rich, and the pilots miscalculated the fuel requirements to get to our destination with a safe supply. We simply ran out of fuel. There were six deaths, 20 survived. Ronnie Van Zant, Stephen Cassie Gaines, Dean Kilpatrick, and both pilots lost their lives. The National Transportation Safety Board said it was a miracle anyone survived. If anyone is responsible for the crash and the demise of Leonard Skinner, it is me, shared in part with Peter Rutsch. It was me that initiated the desire to travel by private plane. I chose the aircraft and I signed the lease. Peter Rudd should have been reviewing the contracts with the attorneys and checking the plane's history and maintenance. I now would have grounded the plane for any mechanical problem whatsoever. The ironic thing about the whole incident is how foreshadowed it was. Ronnie repeatedly told me he wouldn't live to the age of 30. The album was named Street Survivors and the tour, Tour of the Survivors. And I had made a t-shirt the day before with the encryption, Travel at Your Own Risk. I think about them every day of my life and will be haunted by this unfortunate incident to my death.